and show the United States, you'd see that all the pioneering activity in the western two-thirds of the country is happening in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, in 18, starting in 1869, Frederick Marriott developed a uh, airship called the Aptor, and they have a display on it in the main uh, museum room here. And it's uh, significant, uh, it was the first flight of the aircraft in the United States. It didn't have controlled surfaces. It wasn't manned, it was an unmanned flight. flight. They tethered it, and a group of people walked along as this thing rose above the ground and some people carrying it in. I think it was more of a, kind of a prototype to a larger ship they broke to receive financing for. So this particular exhibition was probably just to promote the idea and maybe attract investors. Uh, but what is important about it is a young 11-year-old boy attended this exhibition by the name of John Montgomery. And this was very inspiring to him. So his first interest in aviation was really this lighter-than-air technology that he witnessed in the year 1869. He went home and built a small-scale model of it, and he was really fascinated by just the whole idea of flight. Uh, John received his education, formal education in Jesuit institutions in the Bay Area, initially at Santa Clara College in the high school department, later at St. Ignatius, where he finished his bachelor's and master's programs in science. His teachers, uh, Joseph Neri on the left, Joseph Bema on the right, were known, were prominent scientists in the Western United States, and they were known to be visionary thinkers, both based in visionary science and invention. Neri on the left in mainly in electricity and mathematics, uh, Bema in mathematics and molecular science. So uh, John was very heavily influenced by not only the quality of that education he received, but this idea of being willing to engage in visionary science and not being too concerned about what people thought of your theories. Uh, he was willing to stand on his own with a lot of his work. Uh, after graduating from the college about 1882, he, the family relocated from the Bay Area to San Diego County to a place called the Otay Valley, which is just north of the Mexican border. At the time, it, uh, well, present day Chula Vista, if any of you know San Diego County very well, but at the time it was a very remote area. And uh, all of the people who lived out there were engaged in agriculture, mostly the growing of uh, vineyards and fruit. Uh, the family's, the main home is uh, right up there. And then off to the right, there's a structure, a frame structure. The lower part contained art studios, and then over here, at John's blacksmith shop, where he did a lot of work maintaining equipment for the ranch, and also building flying machine technology. And the upstairs was his laboratory. In the years 1884 through 1886, John built three, a series of, of aircraft. They were not motorized. Uh, each one had certain developments incorporated into it. The first uh, relied on weight shifting for control. And he had an elevator that could be operated as a back of craft that uh, operated the control pitch. Uh, with the second craft of 1885, he added in what were the equivalent of ailerons. This is the drawing of an 1885 craft. Still in 1885, he designed it in 1884, that's why it's titled that way. But what's significant about this is he took this airfoil and created a surface that was on hinges that could be operated by the pilot while in gliding flight. He also had the elevator at the rear and he could do roll, uh, he could also respond to, to gusts, and he could operate the elevator while in short light flights in the Otay Valley. He would incorporate some of this technology into his famous craft with Santa Clara at a later point in time, and that's important to know here. Uh, kind of going on, skipping through his history very quickly, and we'll go into all of it in a lot more detail, but in 1893, an important event happened in uh, aviation history in America. The first uh, instance of professionals and scientists getting together and sharing information about their theories and their work in aviation. 
prior to this, it was very commonly um, the idea that somebody would believe that people who get heavier than air flight was considered to be laughable. And so, if you were somebody who believed it was possible, like Montgomery, you tended to be very discreet about your work. You tended not to publish it because you would bring ridicule to you. John, uh, as he was doing some of his earlier experiments in Otai Valley, experienced the ridicule from some of the neighboring ranches. So that uh, sort of reinforced the idea for him that society wasn't ready yet to accept that this was a possibility. And also, um, prominent scientists of the period were publishing articles where they were saying it was impossible for a heavier than air machine to fly. Uh, so at this event, in Chicago, the World's Fair, they had an Aeronautical Congress. And John showed up uh, unannounced. He wasn't invited. He crashed it, basically. And uh, the, the organizers, Octave Chanute and Albert Zam, Octave Chanute was a very prominent civil engineer in the period in, uh, in the railroad industry. And uh, John impressed them. So they invited him to speak. He spoke about his laboratory control experiments. And then he made a second speech where he described his heavier than air flying machines in the mid 1880s. He shared that technology with his peers. Uh, that second speech, which was an important one, has been lost in history. And it wasn't until we did our research we discovered that he actually shared this information with his peers. This is 1893. Now, skipping ahead a bit here, uh, about the turn of the century, a uh, Frenchman by the name, or actually a Brazilian by the name of France, by the name of uh, Alberto Santos Dumont, developed airships. And uh, in France, airships have been around for quite a while. They were very, before I had everybody else, pretty much except for perhaps Germany in uh, airship technology. And, uh, but Santos Dumont really popularized this. He really brought worldwide attention idea of airships, and he was quite successful at it. He was very wealthy, and to build something like this and train people to help you fly it, and to buy the materials and the supply, and the gas, and it was a very expensive venture. Usually, you either had to be seen as quite wealthy, or you put together a stock company that sold stock in order to fund this kind of research. Uh, in uh, about late got together in San Francisco and they secured funding for an airship project which they were going to call the California Eagle. And this was really one of the things that came out of the French airship experiments and demonstrations that stimulated interest in this particular technology in America. But about late 1902 there were perhaps five or six people in America who were had gotten the money together to build this kind of craft. But they had to rely on the popular technology of the day for propellers was based on marine technology, which worked great in water, but when applied to the air, it was very inefficient. So this particular craft, the California Eagle, used these large, awkward-looking paddles, which uh, it turned out when they, when they tried to fly this thing, they could get it up in the air, and they rather got pushed around and had a difficult time, and even a light heaviness. It just couldn't, it wasn't uh, efficient enough. Uh, but a man, uh, one of the people who got involved in this project was Thomas Bobble, who had a famous parachute jumper. He conceived the idea of parachute jumping in San Francisco in 1887. And for the next two decades, parachute jumping was a very popular sport. It was done in carnivals and exhibitions all over the country, and in fact, all over the world. Baldwin was, uh, made it popular, really. He was, uh, First person to come up with this idea to do it regularly. Father's breath was the eighth person on this project, and he was a physician who was also a dabbled in engineering. And this was primarily his project. Baldwin was hired on as the aeronaut to operate the thing. He didn't really know a lot about the mechanical side of things. He was really uh, a bit, in addition to being a parachute jumper, he was a balloon manufacturer, so he was an experienced balloonist as well. Baldwin will become a very important character in American aviation history not long after this. <laughs>